All right, let's get uh, let's get started this morning, folks. Um, so happy to see everyone here. Uh, thanks for hanging with us all the way to, to Friday. Congratulations. Uh, we really appreciate you trooping through this with us. Um, there's been a lot of great stuff, so hopefully folks have, have gotten a lot out of it. And we will have recordings available afterwards. So if folks want to um, connect into those once we get those up, you'll be able to see some of the things that you might have had to have missed. Um, I am going to start with saying thank you to our sponsors. There we go. Um, did we skip over that? No, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Here's our panel. <clears throat> this is what we're about to experience today. Uh, really looking forward to, to chatting with these folks today. And um, I do want to give a big thank you to our sponsors today, um, especially want to um, acknowledge CAL FIRE, uh, DWR, uh, DOC, and Natural Resource Conservation Service for being uh, incredibly generous with us, as well as all of the other folks on the screen. Um, everyone's been, been wonderful in helping us to be able to create this space. And uh, in particular today, we do want to acknowledge uh, Department of Water Resources. They've sponsored this session, so thank you for this and um, all of your participation throughout conference and, and the sponsorship. It really, really helps us make this happen, so thank you. Um, oops, that is not there. Let me stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to turn this over to Kellex. Um, and Kellex is going to go ahead and start us off. So hello, everyone, and um, get settled in. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, we wanted to just get a quick sense of, um, of who's here and um, who's in this session. And the first thing that we wanted to ask is if um, I'm going to ask um, everyone, including the, um, the presenters, to um, stop your video. And then um, would you, we're gonna spotlight and just get a sense of who's in the room. Would you spotlight, turn your video on if you are from um, a public agency that's not an RCD, so a state or federal agency? Anybody here from state or federal agencies? Great. All right, so a handful of you. You can go ahead and turn, oh. Um, Oh, Xerces, I think of as usually a nonprofit. So, um, so if you can turn your screen off um, or turn your video off and turn your video on if you're from um, an NGO, a nonprofit organization that's an RCD partner. Get a sense of who all is here. Great. Let's see, Point Blue, Sustainable Conservation, Xerces Society, Watershed Center. Hi, Allison. CARCD, of course, is. Okay, great. Can you um, then turn that, um, turn your video off? And let's, um, in lieu of a show of hands, let's um, turn your video on if you are um, associated specifically with an RCD. A lot of us. Hi, RCD peeps. And of course, because we're RCD people, I think we should also do the hug that we usually get at conference. So <laughs> missing your hugs this year. Um, and then if you can turn your, um, your videos off and if you're from, um, if you're someone who didn't get to spotlight yourself because you're not with um, an agency or an RCD or an NGO, can you turn your video on? All right, great, thanks. All right, you can all turn your um, your videos back on. And now it's just a good chance to see who's here. And then the next thing that I wanted to ask you all to do is in the chat box, if, um, if you would just put in the chat box why you're here today, why this session, what interested you about this session, something brief, we're gonna see it all scrolling up, we'll all just kind of get a chance to see what each other says and make sure that you do it to everyone, not just to the panelists, but in the chat, um, um, just your, your why for today, why you're here.
Okay, it looks like some folks want some updates or to learn more. Um, interest in regulations, thinking this is important. Some people were involved, some people were part of this effort. Um, looks like a lot of people have been tracking us, um, the cutting green tape part that is, wanting to see restoration, wanting to see speeded up restoration, pace and scale, momentum, important subject. Great, great. Wanting to get more done, want to hear more about what's going on. A lot of themes about just wanting to know what's going on and people who are motivated to get work done. Got it, thank you. Okay, so that was just a little bit of orientation, the kind of stuff that maybe we would do differently if we were together in person. Um, that said, why don't I go ahead and um, pass this off to, to Karen to get us going. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. And uh, thanks to the panel. Uh, these are some really fantastic people and I'm excited we get a chance to talk with them today. Um, I wanna start off and just ask you guys about um, the frame, just to frame this a little bit and give us all an idea of, um, of what's going on and why we're here. So Jennifer, would you be willing to, to just think about uh, that framing for us? Let us understand this work in context of the overall big picture. Sure, and Karen, thank you for having me. Um, I hate to correct the leader of a group, but I'm the deputy secretary for biodiversity and habitat. Definitely not the secretary, that would get me in trouble, but oh, it's still goodness, a super sorry. cool title and I'm very excited about it. So, um, so thank you for having me. Uh, so hi everyone on the on the screen. I wish we were in person too. Kellex tells me you're a really fun, uh, warm, wonderful group. Maybe this time next year we can we can do this in person. Um, I am Jennifer Norris. I'm the new Deputy Secretary for Biodiversity and Habitat. And um, among many of the hats I wear, um, my main initiative, one of my main initiatives is cutting the green tape, which um, is why you're all here. Um, largely, I'm responsible for helping the state uh, establish and implement its biodiversity strategy. Obviously, we do biodiversity in lots of different parts of the California Natural Resources Agency, but it's my responsibility to sort of try to pull those threads together um, and do things in a more strategic and targeted way. And as part of that, obviously, biodiversity conservation requires restoration. And restoration leads to permitting, and permitting is often challenging. Um, I spent the last 16 years working for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, don't throw things at me, um, and I was a regulator, and I know exactly what it's like to be on the other side of the table, and I think that puts me in a good position to help uh, facilitate permit streamlining and figure out how we can make processes within government work better. So cutting the green tape is one of my jobs, um, and I really see this as a big broad tent that encompasses lots of different pieces, two of which you're gonna hear about from Kellex and Erica. I can't take credit for them, but I'm definitely excited to be part of it and working with them. Folks across government, at least across the state, they recognize that um, we need to get restoration done more quickly, more effectively. We need to do it now. Um, the biodiversity crisis isn't gonna wait for us to figure these things out. So, um, Lots of different entities are, are dipping their toe in figuring out how to make processes work better. CDFW, as you know, got a one-time $4 million uh, funds last year to work on some of their processes. They're putting together, they've put together some pilot programs, which I know Kellex has been part of, uh, looking at their um, fish restoration permit program. They've also invested some time and energy to help with Erica's project, which she'll talk about. So CDFW is working on some of their processes, working on streamlining their programmatic permitting, see if they can do things more quickly. Um, there are other, there's other work within the Coastal Commission. There's teams across the state. I've been working um, in the Sacramento Valley on um, some large scale restoration projects to see how we can do integrated permitting for complex gnarly uh, water, water, water restoration projects. So anyhow, it's a big job and there's lots going on and it's my hope that I can sort of bring my expertise to bear to try to help some of those things move along. So the context is it's important. The biodiversity crisis is real. I don't think I even need to talk to this group about something like that, but um, I'm here to help and I look forward to the conversation. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for being here. And I'm glad if anything, I promoted you. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't get me in trouble with my boss. Some people on this call could call him. Um, Kellex, I'm really excited to hear that this is all happening. Um, I, as long as I've known you, this has been something that you've been talking about um, from probably my first day stepping inside the door as ED. So I'm um, really excited to see this uh, really taking on the scale that it has. Can you talk about the process and um, what the high level recommendations are that are going to come out? Absolutely. So um, for those of you whom I have not met, uh, my name is Kellex Nelson. I'm the executive director of the San Mateo RCD. And I have been a very squeaky wheel about this for a long time. And um, like many of you, I have benefited from existing efforts to streamline permitting, particularly those that have been developed in advance by our partners at Sustainable Conservation. So really glad that Erica is on this panel as well. Um, so um, um, our, this, I think a lot of this speaks to partnership. Our RCD um, participates in the Santa Cruz Mountains Stewardship Network, a collaborative of, an, of over 20 organizations throughout the bioregion doing stewardship. That group joined and helped to form the California Landscape Stewardship Network, which is a network of landscape stewarding networks um, that covers about 40% of the geography of California. Both the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network and the California Landscape Stewardship Network identified this issue as a priority. Coincidentally, I participate in both those groups. And, um, and so then we were able to get a meeting with Secretary Crowfoot, who really was compelled to partner and find solutions. And he understood that for many of us, the irony that the greatest barrier to us restoring natural resources are the regulations intended to restore natural resources. And so how do we how do we find something that's right fitting when these regulations are essential to stopping bad actions from happening, but aren't necessarily well designed to enable or incentivize good actions to happen. So um, Secretary Crowfoot and the California Landscape Stewardship Network partnered and big shout out to my board of directors that enabled me to essentially be on detail for about 90% of my time for many months to work on this. Um, so over the past year, we held three round tables and had dozens of phone calls incorporating the input over 150 people around the state, environmental nonprofits, restoration practitioners, advocacy groups, large landowner groups, public and private land managers, local, state, federal, um, government agencies, tribes, water utilities, working lands, businesses, the, the pretty much the range. And these stakeholders identified 45 potential actions that form the basis of the recommendations in a report that we'll be releasing very soon. These are focused on where the opportunity was, which is in state government reforming um, how some of these processes in state in California. So they don't address other issues regarding federal um, regulatory processes. And they also don't address cultural or resource related regulations. These are uh, environmental um, regulations. Um, and because, um, um, well, let me just say that the recommendations are at intentionally different scales. So some of them are very aspirational. Some people are like, blow up this system and create a whole new system. And some are an incremental change. And some are, look, there's already an exemption for small scale habitat restoration in CEQA, but it's not functioning as intended. Can we have some clarity on this, please? Um, there were a couple of overriding themes that came up from stakeholders. One was a real desire for an executive order from the governor. And I'm really pleased to report that the executive order that just came out on my 50th birthday, so I think it was a gift to me, um, that it specifically said um, it calls for um, reducing these regulatory barriers, essentially um, identifies cutting green tape in the executive order, which was really exciting. And the second thing that came up that was sort of cross cutting was a real need for intra and inter agency coordination on permitting and funding of restoration and stewardship projects. And I wanna note that that need and that desire came up not just from practitioners, but also from agency staff themselves who are, who are desiring to have the support and the ability and the facility to do that. So um, let's see, what else? Um, um, 
Uh, in terms of the recommendations that we made, when there were 45 um, of these recommendations, when multiple recommendations were basically speaking to the same outcome, we always opted for the one that was not legislative. Um, so really ultimately what we're hoping for is culture change. We're hoping to create um, a culture in which we're all pulling in the same direction um, to try to make actions happen um, instead of some people, you know, stopping actions to evaluate and some people advancing actions and, and creating something that's oppositional, but rather when there's something that could be owned within an agency or a department to advance solutions, our recommendations defaulted to that as the preferred approach. So that's a sort of a global comment about the, about the approach that we took. We, we think that legislation is valuable and often essential, um, but but there's a lot of uncertainty in legislation and in the sausage making that happens in legislation. And if there isn't ownership um, of solutions really broadly held, there's lots of ways that legislation can be undermined. And so um, so that was the the bias that we had. Um, and so if you can show Karen the first um, the first slide, this is messy and that's on purpose. I want you guys to see the messy process. Um, this is a bubble diagram that basically is how we started to think about taking all these different ideas and putting them together um, to the recommendations in the report. Thank you, Karen. If you can make that. Okay. Don't worry if you can't read this. Even if you could, you probably wouldn't understand it because this is that would involve getting under my lid. Um, so Jim Robbins, um, whom some of you know, and I worked together on this, but we were trying to figure out all these different recommendations. How do we bin them? Do we bin them by outcome? Do we bin them by habitat? Do we bin them by region? Do we bin them by the type of action to be taken? Um, and then they had all these interactions. If you make this one recommendation, then that changes a different recommendation. And um, so, um, this is just to say, not that you need to understand all this or memorize all this, but that the recommendations in the report, while this is a snapshot in time, it's not a contract, it's not the end all be all, it reflects a great deal of thought and our best attempt to integrate um, a lot of different input. So then um, I'll maybe go through what those recommendations are at a high level in the report. Karen, you can go to the next slide. So um, these are the bins. You see that they're not apples to apples, but these are the categories that they fell in. Um, so there are five recommendations in our report that um, focus on building on great existing work um, that's made permitting small projects substantially easier, that decrease practitioner costs, reduce staff time, et cetera. They focus on the Habitat Restoration Enhancement Act, HREA, that sustainable conservation was so involved with getting passed. Um, the General 401 Water Quality Certification Order for Small Habitat Restoration Projects, SHARP, through the, the State Water Board. And the categorical exemption for small habitat restoration projects that exists in CEQA in statute. So those five recommendations um, focus on small scale projects. The next set of recommendations focus on larger scale projects because we keep talking about wanting to get work done at the scale that's required to address the threats that we're facing. Um, these larger projects with multiple benefits are absolutely essential um, to effectively addressing those challenges. And many of the existing efficiencies that have been proof of concept since Secretary Nichols really initiated a lot of this back in the early 2000s, many of these existing efficiencies that some of us use focus on smaller projects. Um, and they can have the incentive of doing smaller scale work rather than larger work. So we want to make sure that there's the opportunity to have incentives for larger work. Then there is um, um, addressing the coastal zone. For those of us who work in the coastal zone, we know that the coastal zone has special protections and that it's managed through really diverse and complex governance that includes the Coastal Commission, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission for San Francisco Bay, and 126 local coastal programs managed through local um, jurisdictions like counties or, or cities. 
Um, so this recommendation focuses on the commission having some tools within its existing authorities that might accelerate permitting of restoration along the coast. The next is um, a recommendation regarding um, stream flow and groundwater projects that involve changes to water rights. Um, and this would basically help create a framework to support and empower water board and um, fish and wildlife staff that are dedicated to this work to help them better coordinate, prioritize and advance the work since they are doing a fair amount of overlapping review when it involves water rights changes. And then, um, then the thing that came up also very frequently that seems like a slam dunk, it seems so obvious, is simplifying permit applications. If a number of um, permits are required for the same project, and they're asking for largely the same information, why can't we just submit one, um, one application? That, it turns out, is a lot more complicated than it seems and very costly and also wh where state permitting interfaces or has a nexus with federal permitting, there's all sorts of sort of firewalls and security protections in place that can make this complicated. So we have two recommendations to help consolidate, coordinate, and streamline um, permitting, permit application and tracking processes with a recognition that this isn't simple and there's a, a number of IT and security and systems considerations. Um, so um, overall, the, the recommendations call for actions by state agencies, by practitioners, and by advocates alike who are committed to active environmental stewardship. And, um, and they really just reflect this particular moment in time that we hope will catalyze broader participation and support for these recommendations um, and beyond. So that's a little bit of uh, an overview. Karen, you can go ahead and get rid of that slide. And I can pass um, my time over to Erica, who can talk about what sustainable conservation is working on. Great. And Erica, I just want to also, we're really excited that you're here today. Um, sustainable conservation has been just a tremendous partner um, to the RCDs and the CARCD uh, over the last 10 years. I and mean, we so much appreciate that. And in addition, uh, sustainable conservation has been working on this uh, for a really long time and you guys have made some really great headway so really happy to hear you talking about the headway that you guys have made and what's out there. Okay great thanks so much Karen and Kellex and, and Jennifer. So let me just pull up I've got a few slides to share here. Just a sec. Just a sec, you should have a, a slideshow in one second here. There we go. You see some slides, Karen? Okay, excellent. So hi everybody, I am Erica Lovejoy with Sustainable Conservation. Uh, and we are a nonprofit that helps California by uniting people to solve some of the toughest challenges around land and water. And the team that I'm a part of works to accelerate the pace of implementation of habitat restoration by developing policy and regulatory incentives to help make it easier to get this important work done. And so today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit more about our strategic approach to accelerating restoration. And then I wanna give you uh, just a real high level look at what's out there already. And then most importantly, give you some really important updates on what we're working on now and some opportunities for you all to provide some input. So to help boost the good work of the re, uh, resource conservation districts and other project proponents out there, we work on several different ways to accelerate restoration. And some of that involves, involves changes to policy. We work on helping to improve funding mechanisms. We develop uh, other incentives that encourage landowners to do more restoration. But as has been alluded to earlier, most folks know us for our work on developing efficient permitting mechanisms. And as we have been talking about, permitting is a huge part of trying to get projects done. And we know it's a very complex, expensive and, and time consuming process. And one of the reasons for this is that restoration projects are regulated in the exact same way as development projects. So as Kellex mentioned, these really important laws out there like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, they were indeed designed to stop bad things from happening, but they don't provide mechanisms to efficiently fix the environmental problems that have been created. So with that, um, sustainable conservation has been 
working on a bigger picture goal to change this and create a new paradigm by putting restoration on a separate regulatory track than development to make it easier for both agencies and project proponents to partner to get this essential work done. So indeed, programmatic permits are one of the key tools that we've been working on for quite some time uh, to help do this. And for those of you who aren't familiar, programmatic permits are permits that are written in advance to cover a wide variety of, a wide variety of the most commonly done and uh, highest priority projects. So the types of projects that qualify for the permits and all of the conditions around them, they're all listed up front. And that helps to create a lot more regulatory certainty and save time and money, especially on those kind of duplicate repetitive steps that are involved in the permitting process. So this helps agencies and uh, applicants and also uh, can offer a much more collaborative process. And we are working on developing uh, more programmatics and other efficient permitting mechanisms in partnership with the major state and federal agencies in California. So uh, I'm gonna just really just give you a very high level overview of uh, some of the work that's been done so far and then get into some updates and opportunities for involvement. So on the left-hand side of this table, you see we've got, uh, we've got the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act. And we sponsored that bill and worked in partnership with uh, DFW back in 2014 uh, to create this process. And it is linked to, as uh, Kellex had mentioned, the small habitat restoration, uh, the small habitat restoration permit that the Water Board has. And with these, it creates a highly efficient process for projects five acres or less. And for DFW, you can get your authorization in 30 to 60 days. So strongly encourage you to take a closer look at that if you aren't already. Next, the NOAA Restoration Center has four biological opinions for restoration throughout the state. Uh, that, and um, that have been developed over a number of years with sustainable conservation, uh, no restoration center and some of our close consulting colleagues like Jim Robbins. So uh, we have helped NOAA to develop a co uh, to, to acquire two consistency determinations for their coastal biological opinions. And that's a pretty big deal for folks who are working with NOAA because they don't have to get a separate coastal development permit uh, for, for their projects in the coastal zone when they work with those NOAA BOs. And so between all of these permits, they have been used almost 500 times by more than 100 different organizations and have really saved a substantial amount of time and resources uh, for agencies and applicants. And that, and you know, and thus allowing more time for technical assistance and that partnership that everyone really desires to help get things done. Okay, now to the updates. So based on this really successful NOAA model, we are uh, working on a collaborative effort with the Army Corps of Engineers, the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the State Water Resources Control Board um, with NOAA's continued involvement. And so without getting into the super wonky technical details, <laughs> um, through these agencies' interrelated permitting processes, we are helping them to develop two more statewide programmatic authorizations. So with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, we are helping to develop the materials for them to issue a statewide biological opinion for restoration for aquatic and riparian habitat uh, restoration projects. Next, we're working with the State Water Resources Control Board to help them develop a statewide general permit or general order as they call it, as well as a statewide programmatic environmental impact report to meet the CEQA uh, requirements. We are coordinating the conditions between all of these agencies and their respective permits. And we expect that that's gonna help tremendously to save time and reduce uh, conflicts and increase regulatory certainty. Uh, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has also provided some input on these processes on conditions and also on the programmatic EIR and that has been very helpful. So in regards to this programmatic environmental imp impact report, it's going to be really useful uh, beyond just approving this permit because it's going to cover the most commonly done aquatic restoration habitat activities and in some cases 
agencies will be able to utilize it for future approvals and where some additional environmental analysis needs to be done, this document can be tiered off of. So folks are really going to be able to take advantage of the information uh, and analysis that this, that will be in this document and save uh, lots of time and resources and have and for uh, for on the ground work. So for funders, it's going to be helpful too. So overall, we estimate that more than $124 million in grant and private funds can be saved over 10 years of use of these authorizations once they're all in place, given the efficiencies that they will help to create. And then our goal is for these authorizations to be available for applicants by summer 2021, which as these things go, is actually not too far off, okay? Uh, we are really actually in the home stretch for getting these things done. And I wanted to let you know that there is an opportunity for you all to provide some input and support. The State Water Board's um, General Order and Programmatic Environmental Impact Report are gonna be out for public review, we uh, expect in early February. And so this is your opportunity to show your support to the State Water Board and let them know how important it really is to have efficient permitting for restoration. Next, we are also gonna be working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to reauthorize the Habitat Restoration and Enhancement Act uh, during this uh, upcoming legislative session because the act actually expires uh, in January 1st, uh, 2022. So we surveyed folks who have used the act. Some of you all out there have had received a survey to get some input on uh, any potential improvements to the act. So we really appreciate all the RCDs and others who have responded to that survey. Thank you very much. Uh, but for anybody else who wants to chime in and you have ideas on uh, potential improvements to the act, we uh, do encourage you to respond to the survey that we put together, uh, but it, that we have to have those responses by uh, by the end of the month, November 30th, because we've got legislative deadlines and such we have to deal with. So you can learn more about how to, uh, about all of these things by going to our CARCD virtual booth. Who knew things like this would happen, would exist, but CARCD has virtual booths and we have a whole slew of information on, uh, on these efforts that are going on, as well as, uh, ways for you to learn more about the technical resources that sustainable co conservation offers to help you uh, better use, utilize programmatic permits. You can get on our mailing list and you can hear the latest updates and uh, public uh, comment opportunities, as well as be part of the surveys that we send out and where we ask for folks input uh, and, it, and we use that to help develop policy and permitting tools. So last but not least, I wanna give a quick shout out to our funders because without their support, we could not do this really important work. And we are being supported by a pretty diverse group of public and private interests who, who either fund or implement restoration projects and recognize that we need to have an efficient permitting strategy in order to move all these high priority projects forward and get the work done now, as Jennifer says, uh, to help Re reco re recover species, restore habitat, and address uh, impacts from climate change. So uh, we really appreciate their support. Okay, thank you very much. All so, right. Back to you, Karen. Thank you, Erica. And as I said at the beginning, thank you so much for all the partnership and support that um, Sustainable uh, Conservation has provided to RCDs and CARCD as well. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, now that you guys have done a really fantastic job of introducing the topic, before we get into the more conversational part, it'd be really great to know about you. So as we've been framing up with all of our panelists uh, throughout conference, we'd love to hear from you all. Um, what is your why, your personal why, why you do this work? And what was that aha moment that uh, made you realize that this is what you wanted to do with your life? And uh, Erica, I'll call on you first. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> had many aha moments, but in, in regarding to this particular work, so I don't know how many of you know out there that I used to work for regulatory agencies for a very long time. In fact, I think at least one of my old bosses is on this uh, webinar. Um, and 
I was, you know, I took my job very seriously, like all the folks in, in regulatory roles. I mean, they're working very, very hard to protect the resources that are out there. And they really, they really put a lot into it. But then when I went from a regulatory role into working for a nonprofit organization and one where we work very closely with restoration project proponents, and then just folks started having a lot of honest conversations and, and, you know, telling us what they were going through and what they were dealing with. And I just, I always knew the process was hard, but I didn't really know and start until I started, you know, being able to have these conversations with folks. And so that was a huge motivator for me, um, being able to kind of understand where the regulatory agencies are coming from and the, the, the challenges that they have and versus the folks who are really desperately trying to partner with them. Um, so, so that's, that's definitely inspired me to do what I'm doing now. Thanks, Erica and Kellex, I'm going to uh, pick on you next. Do you want me to share the slides? Sure. Go ahead. All right. So Karen told us that she was going to ask us our why. And so I asked her to show these images while I talk. This is my why you could just cruise through them, Karen. So, um, I, I grew up playing in the woods. I was a kid who got summer feet, you know, um, your shoes came off the last day of school and didn't go on again until after Labor Day. And um, I loved being in the outdoors. Um, I was not a fencing land off and people can't be there type of person. I saw myself in the world, um, interacting with it. When I started, um, working in this, um, I was really struck by how hard it was to do the right thing and how ground down I would get trying to do the right thing. I remember once taking my mom for a drive and showing her this property that I was managing, which is now a national park. And it's a big mountain. I was like, I manage this property. She was like, what do you mean you manage it? Where's the mountain going to go? Like, there's nothing to do. It's a mountain. It's not going to go anywhere. And actually, incidentally, it is eroding and going somewhere, but I didn't get into that. Um, but I think that stewardship is largely invisible. I think people connect, I connect in such almost a primal way with um, beautiful places um, and with restoration. And um, I want it to be easier to care for these places. Like I profoundly want it to be easier. That's it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Kellex. And those, uh, thank you. I felt so much calmer after looking through almost all of those. <laughs> all right, Jennifer, yours. I'm glad they went first because I could have picked a lot of things. I mean, <clears throat> I could, I could definitely share a lot of pictures in my mental head that are similar to Kellex's. I feel that connection to the land and I feel very moved about our role in protecting and stewarding uh, the planet. Um, but I will tell you that the why for this particular work for me is that um, some of the most satisfying uh, moments in my career have been when people come together to solve problems and um, even as a regulator, I found there were incredible successes when people sort of dropped their story about who they were and they dropped their, put their hat down and just sat around a table and rolled up their sleeves and said, what do we have in common? What can we do together? Um, and I believe that everybody who works in conservation wants to do good. I mean, that's what we keep hearing. Um, and so there is a solution out there. Um, we just have to work to find it. And I'm really excited to be in this job where I have an opportunity, I hope, to affect some change by really digging in and working with others to solve, solve that because that will be really satisfying. Fantastic. Thank you, folks. And that was actually a perfect segue uh, into my next question, uh, which is that, you know, all of us are passionate about the environment. We all want to see it protected. We all know that environmental regulations were put in place specifically to protect the environment. So we all, uh, in some way, in some level, appreciate that they are there. Um, and they've been scientifically um, based. They have been you know, uh, vetted. And they are there for a very specific reason. 
And I know one of the, the some of the pushback that you get, and certainly as I'm talking about these things, the pushback that I hear from folks is that we want to make sure that even in restoration projects, we're still protecting the things that we mean to protect. And therefore, you know, should we really be loosening up these regulations? And so I'd love to hear what your response is when folks ask you that question. I would not say that anything we're trying to do is loosening any regulations. Uh, I'd rather say we're looking for um, clarity about how we use them so that when the effects are short term with a long term benefit or when they are small and for a larger scale benefit, we can take that into account in a more effective way. I think it's really challenging in California. I'll just say that, um, I mean, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but there are so many different entities with very real responsibilities. And I think the folks that make it hard for all of you to do your work, it's because they've been, they've been burned or they've been sued or they've been, um, they've gotten in trouble or there's some other situation that they've encountered that's gone really awry and they don't wanna be responsible for that. And so um, the bad actors can really make all the good work harder. And so I think what we're trying to do with this um, effort is to figure out how to how to describe what we're trying to do in such a way that we can get the good things done quickly without keeping those without allowing sort of the bad stuff to filter through too. And so it's it's a I think it's a little bit delicate and I, I give a lot of credit to Erica's approaches on these uh, programmatic permits. I, I'm a, I've been a big believer in that for a long time. You set up the rules, you make them very clear. And if everybody follows them, they get their permit more quickly. It actually takes a lot of work up front um, and sustainable conservation has invested a lot of that work on your behalf. So I hope you all take um, advantage of these permits when they're done because um, it really can make everybody's job easier. The regulators, the regulated, and it gets the work done. So um, I, don't think, I don't think any of this is about loosening regulation. It's really about figuring out how to use the rules in a way that gets good things done more clearly and more quickly. I think I'd like to add to that, if I may, that um, a couple of thoughts. One is that, you know, what what we've heard when talking with a lot of these agencies, staff um, throughout this process and and beyond, is um, is yeah, those of you who are doing this restoration work feel like you're where the rubber meets the road, but it's still optional. It's still voluntary, and we are the ones that like these. These are people who've spent. 20, 30, 40 years of their life um, upholding um, a statutory protection um, that they feel like they're, they're holding the, the, the final line, you know, on this. And they're still seeing losses to biodiversity or to water quality or whatever it is that they're protecting. So, um, you know, just kind of like really honoring that, that mindset is really important. The other thing is that we do have to be careful that we're that we might be approaching this from a certain mindset of it's got to be easier to do our work um, without recognizing fully where we might create um, inadvertently create loopholes that that bad actors could use and the, and that that um, as RCDs and watershed restoration practitioners we also we absolutely must as a community keep our nose clean and make sure that we do our work really well because when one of us, I, I'll, I'll frequently hear a story about something that happened in another county 17 years ago that's still affecting the ability of an agency staff person to trust the abilities or the intentions of, of my agency. So I think we need to act with the utmost integrity and we need to be thoughtful about unintended consequences, even if that's a painful process. I thank you, Kellex and Jennifer. Uh, indeed, uh, a lot of work does is put into these, say, programmatic permits to make sure they definitely have plenty of conditions that folks had to adhere to, uh, and. They also serve as really good planning tools because there's design criteria and all sorts of things in there. The, the bottom line is that the tools are available, um, especially when there is there is help from uh, external parties because it's really tough for the agency folks with their limited resources to, to work on what may seem like something extra. These folks are, are buried and don't have a lot of resources. But we have seen like with the use of programmatic permits, NOAA Restoration Center is a perfect example 
of how much it has really helped them move restoration projects forward and work in partnership with organizations like, like Kellex's uh, to get projects done and where it's really boosted the morale, I would say, of those staff who are really putting their blood, sweat and tears into trying to protect the environment um, and giving them a tool and, and really to put restoration on a separate track. So it's, it's really, you know, creating these tools, whether it's policy mechanisms or uh, um, executive orders or, or programmatic permits to just kind of, and or funding in a different group. Like if you look at the fisheries restoration grant program, that's a perfect example of how a lot of restoration pro project proponents love that because it's kind of all done in one shop with the goal to partner with restoration project proponents to get the work done. So more of that can be done. Uh, we can all do this together. The one, the one thing that I would add to this is that um, we do need to keep the communications pathways and the trust and the relationships solid and the integrity solid because one of the things that my work on, on this started about a year and a half ago with a white paper that um, Jim Robbins and Sharon Farrell and I published on um, assessing the effectiveness of existing efficiencies. And there are a number that don't function as intended. Um, a number do and a number don't, or it's really inconsistent in how they're interpreted or how they function. And so I do think that um, having the, the solutions in place, the, you know, the programmatic permits or exemptions or a new legislation or new pathways is part of the equation, but then maintaining the intent of them is another part of the equation. And that's uh, part of that, that's that piece about making sure that we're all pulling in the same direction. Great. Um, I see we have about 12 minutes left. So I'm going to ask you this last, and there's some great questions in the chat. So let me ask you this uh, last question, and maybe you could very briefly answer it, and then uh, we can move on, which is a really simple question of what's it going to take going forward to make this happen? What are still kind of the critical things that we need to achieve? Jen, what's do you want to do, do you want to talk about that? Oh, I, was, I thought you were about to speak. You go ahead, Kellex. Uh, the vision for implementation. Do you want to speak to that? Well, you mean for the for the report specifically? For cutting green tape, yeah, as as it as as the resources agency envisions it. Well, the cutting the green tape initiative is going to be ongoing, right? I mean, I, I'm going to be you know looking across all the programs to be looking for opportunities, and so you know I'm I'm working on funding issues. I'm working on cross agency coordination issues, but specifically with regard to the report that Kellex is referring to, you know that has some specific regulatory and policy changes that. Um, the resources agency can undertake. And I think to the degree that there are ones that were within our purview, we're gonna look into implementing those. Um, there are others that are uh, actually require legislative changes. And um, I think we're hoping that the larger stakeholder community uh, works in coordination uh, with folks like Kellex to figure out how to move those forward or Erica to the degree that they're, you know, HRA reauthorization, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot to do and not all of it's under our purview, but the parts that are under ours, we're gonna be shepherding those through. Um, Karen, can we, uh, there's, there are a number of questions that came up in the chat box I wanna make sure that we uh, have time for. Can, can I shift to talking about the, um, the questions and the, the topic around fees? That would be great. Permitting fees. So um, this did come up in a lot of the conversations around cutting green tape. Unfortunately, it coincided with a very significant economic recession for the state. And when state employees took a 10% pay reduction and these fees um, are, um, are, are used to help support operations of these organizations. So it really just was not timely um, to have a conversation about cutting another revenue source for the agency. So that just was not a path to go down at this point in time. Um, but I wanna say that I don't think that we are going to be very effective in asking uh, on any significant scale for fees to be waived or eradicated without also advocating for sufficient funding for these agencies that comes from other mechanisms. So I think what we need to be a partner to the agencies and ensuring that they're adequately funded at the same time that we're asking that the funding doesn't come from restoration projects. 
I don't think you can do one without the other. That's my personal opinion. And yeah. Kelly, I have to say, I just have just have to respond to that. I think you are out so uh, spot on. I mean, the agencies need to have the separate independent funding sources. And this is a whole nother aspect of putting restoration on a separate track. And we are hoping that, you know, once we get past this, the situation we're in right now with this pandemic, um, that we can really look for innovative funding sources so the agencies are not fee driven. And I think it'll make it a lot easier for them to partner with restoration project proponents and take off some of that pressure and to do their jobs. So, and I think there's a really great opportunity for a statewide network of RCDs to show that we can be a partner to the state agencies and supporting them getting that funding in ways that we can exert influence or advocacy or communication tools. Um, yeah, and I'll, um, I'll just add as part of the visioning process for um, Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, part of what we were doing uh, on that uh, committee was to look at their budget. And um, they're starting to shift some things, so it's changed a bit over the last year or two. But um, they are chronically underfunded, and they have, um, because of everybody kind of carves out their little area, they had something, I can't, I'm not going to get the number right, but they have something like uh, just a ton of these just like special interest things. So they may have had money actually sitting in their budget, but it could only be spent on, you know, red-legged frogs, or it could only be spent on these very specific items and trying to figure out how to help them get to a place where they have a budget that can fund um, their staff well enough to be able to engage is a really critical piece that they've asked us as partners to do. And then a number of partners have stepped up to try to push through um, to make sure that they, they have the ability to engage fully. And there's another question in the comment box from Michael Bowen. Hi again, Michael, um, from the Coastal Conservancy, um, asking about, uh, tell me if I'm not characterizing this properly, but essentially underground regulation, you know, that, um, that, um, that in some cases what we're seeing is that um, the design review and engagement process can turn into something that's kind of one way um, and um, can function um, like, uh, like restriction. And um, it's an interesting point that you bring up, Michael. It's something that, um, we kind of spoke to not in this process, not in cutting green tape, which is focused on state um, uh, regulatory systems, but in the white paper that we wrote about a year and a half ago, we really talked about uh, our, our assessment at that point was that the, um, that the most effective solutions were ones that were coming out of collaboratives that were based on trust building and relationship. Um, that when we dem, and that's why I also come back to the RCD community, the practitioner community, to do our jobs well, to, to keep our nose clean, to do our jobs well, and when we make a mistake, to own it and to share it and engage about it. Because I don't think that people are going to feel comfortable, um, you know, supporting, um, but, but they won't know who has the ability to actually do design, a good design, um, and be able to sort of turn over the car keys a little bit more without some of that trust in place. It's my thinking. I don't know if um, Eric or Jen have comments on that. I, I fully agree. It, I think it is a lot about trust. I, I do understand from some of the agency folks that um, just, you know, uh, playing devil's advocate, looking at both perspectives here, is that they, some of them, some of the agencies do indeed have some real experts uh, present. Um, Maybe they're, and so they want to, they want to be able to, they have seen, just as you said, it may have only happened once every 10 years or something like that, but there was a project that they felt uncomfortable with or really needed work on design. And they were concerned about, about folks not really reaching out to them in advance to help provide input on design. Um, so I think, I think that is something that I've heard. And then also have heard uh, again from folks trying to get the projects done is that we are trying to move things forward and we're getting, you know, we feel like we're not being trusted. We have some really solid projects. We have our experts ourselves. And this is just a uh, maybe excessive oversight in some circumstances. So um, we kind of have both uh, parts of the spectrum and that trust part is essential. It's like, we really need to have a, <laughs> For the regulatory folks, you know, again, I'm, I am that, I was worked in that role for a really long time, but the, trying to shift gears for the greater good so we can all get these projects done, we don't have time to wait. We are losing species. 
uh, and losing habitat. And we have to find a way to work together more efficiently to get it done. And so help us figure that out. <laughs> so. All right, I see we have four minutes left. Uh, Kellex, was there something else that jumped out at you or should I open the, the floor up for questions? I think you can open it up. I think the, the, the themes we kind of talked on. Okay, great. Who else has a question for the team? All right, Paul, oh, go for it. I've got a question. Um, I was curious, um, it sounds like the DEIR is gonna be coming out in February for public review. Um, I was curious what the scope of uh, practice types or projects are that are included in that. Paul, could, just There's, for people who are less familiar with what a DEIR is or what you're referring to, do you mind spelling it out? Oh, sure. The draft environmental impact report that Erica referenced really yes. uh, from the water boards. Yeah, sure. No problem. So um, it's really the most commonly done restoration project types. It's, it's uh, not right now, not size limited. It's not for small scale projects. It's for projects of all sorts, all sizes, but really that meet certain conditions and have uh, are implemented in a certain way. So as I've said, we've talked about conditions uh, with all these different agencies, um, but it's things like floodplain restoration, uh, riparian habitat restoration, uh, uh, off-channel, side-channel habitat, um, let me see, wetlands restoration. Uh, I mean, it kind of covers the gamut of your standard, even even bigger things like levy setbacks. And uh, it's, it's, it's really intended to look at projects that could be done across the state. It's not looking at one particular region. So we looked at different things that are being done around the state. And we actually surveyed uh, restoration project proponents and spent a long time getting information on what additional things need to be to be done. And then we built off those NOAA Restoration Center biological opinions. So if you've seen those, Paul, then you get a sense of the starting point. Karen, there, is a, sorry, Erica, there isn't a question about this, but recognizing that we don't have much time left, there's something I want to put a plug in for, if I may, um, which is that um, this particular effort, this has been a big lift and there's a lot more moving forward. The great, that's cutting green tape. The stuff that sustainable conservation has done, it is doing is really important. There are others around the state who are working on this. Department of Fish and Wildlife has been um, working on their own internal processes. You know, I know there's other collaboratives around the state. There's a lot of people. Um, so we don't are, we're not suggesting that what we're doing is the end all be all or the only thing. Um, and also that there's additional future phases of cutting green tape that are that we're going to be working on that include um, complexities with funding um, and other aspects because what we do know is that the effects of climate change are here now it's happening already and probably bigger and sooner than we thought it would be there is a biodiversity crisis now um, there are really big issues fires flooding sedimentation water quality impairments that are very big and we must be working at the scale um, to meet these threats now. And um, there's a lot of different systems at play in doing that. So um, don't feel like this is being taken care of and so you don't need to do anything. Um, if there's a way for you to engage in this, this is gonna need to be owned by everybody um, and communicated by everybody um, because what we're also talking about is kind of niche and esoteric. For most people, we work in a very niche world. For most people in California, um, they're, they're not even aware that you need to get permits to do environment. They're not aware that restoration exists. And they're not aware that you need permits to do restoration and they're not aware that that's a challenge. So, you know, communicating about your work broadly and building diverse allies and making sure that we are never um, set opposed to environmental advocacy groups or others, I think is the work that's before us. Thanks folks. This is an amazing um, how we've been finishing all panels in one word. Uh, what's the thing that's bringing you joy in the midst of all of this uh, chaos and the really heavy things that you guys are hitting on? Fall foliage, it's two words. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Rain, <laughs> at least we got some. <laughs> I can't do it in one word. Coho release on Monday, Tuesday, it was so awesome. <laughs> <laughs>
helpful. <laughs> thanks, everyone. And thanks for being here. This has been wonderful. Uh, uh, we will see you uh, hopefully at the Speak Off and um, our next presentations. Thanks, everybody, for joining us.